Good morning, Collision Church. You guys feeling good? I don't believe it. Let's try again. Are you guys feeling good this morning? Miracles when you move, such an easy thing for you to do. Your How many know this morning that God has never lost a battle? He hasn't and he won't. 
Oh, we are so glad to have you here this morning. If you're visiting for the first time, thank you for joining us. Just a few announcements that we have to make today to get us started, and then we'll get back into our praise and worship time. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we announced uh, that we're going to be moving into a new building. Uh, our hope is to get that accomplished within the next couple of months. Uh, you have an opportunity to sign up online uh, to do the work over there. We're going to be contacting you more than likely this week, no later than next week on when we're going to get started on all of that. Some of the work has already begun. There's some contractors in there doing some stuff to get some bathrooms situated and uh, some other things are happening. But demolition day is going to be soon. Uh, there's a lot of work that we need to do in there. Yeah, to get that, as we call collisionized. Um, you know, we got to find somewhere to put a door like that in the, the auditorium and just kidding. But uh, for those of you that don't know that joke, we've been, this will be our fourth building in the past four and a half, almost five years. And uh, every one of them has had one of those, uh, except for this one we're going to. So anyway, um, we are excited about what God's going to do there. In two weeks, um, we're going to be doing something special here. Uh, this is going to take quite a bit of money. We, we kind of went over the budget yesterday with the board to kind of determine exactly what it's going to take us uh, to get in there. And we do have some available, but uh, we really, really need some help in order to get there. Um, so in two weeks, the offering in two weeks, everything given that week and the whole week will just go to that project. So if God lays it on your heart to give a little bit extra or something different that week, uh, we would love to see you participate in that just so that we can help with that. Um, and we can get all those expenses taken care of over there. So again, in two weeks, I'll remind you again next week, but everything given that entire six days between services, all of that given online uh, or given in the box will all go directly to that, pro that project over there uh, to get us moved in and ready to go. Uh, we are so excited about the opportunity that God has given us over there. We can fit quite a bit more chairs in there, uh, quite a bit more people. So we are certainly, certainly excited about that. So I didn't want you to miss out on that opportunity. Um, also, don't forget in two weeks, we have Baptism Sunday. Uh, that takes place, yeah, that takes place at 11 o'clock. So 11 o'clock, if you are interested in being baptized, please make sure you get to our website if you have questions about what baptism is. Uh, we have had a lot of people raise their hand for salvation in here. And the next step is to follow that up with baptism. So uh, you can go right to our website, collision.church, and you can find all the information about baptism and actually sign up there as well to get baptized that day. Um, don't forget about everything we have going on during the week. Uh, tonight will be the uh, men's Bible study at the Peer Support Center at Lighthouse. That's at, uh, at 5 o'clock this evening. And then Wednesday night is our men's and women's groups that we have here at the church that are at 6.30. And then Thursday night is the women's Bible study at the Peer Support Center at 5 o'clock as well. So um, those have been going fantastic, uh, at least on the men's side. And I hear the women's are going, uh, going fantastic as well. So uh, we want you to support all of those and uh, come and be a part of what we're doing here at the church uh, as well. So I think that's it for announcements this morning. We're going to get back into praise. But let's pray before we do that. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. Uh, Lord, that you have brought us together on such a day as this, for such a time as this, to do this that we do. And Lord, I pray, God, that you will help us to come today with a sincere heart that we will praise you today uh, because you are truly, truly worthy of more than we can ever give you in a 25 or a 30 minute time uh, of praising you. But God, help us to give everything we have today. Lord, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts today. I pray that you will condition us um, to hear you and to hear from your word when that's given as well. And I pray, God, that you continue to be with us and guide us uh, through the remainder of our time together. For those that have needs this morning, God, I pray that you'll meet those needs. Uh, for those that have wants this morning, I pray that you'll help them to realize that you'll give them their needs. And Lord, I thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Cause the guy 
your mind You've always been with us Every battle you've already won And you've already won No weather that has ever left a mark on you. There is no army with the power to conquer truth. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won. You've already won. Show me one thing he can't do Show me a mountain he can't move He's the God of the breakthrough Anything is possible Show me one thing that's too hard Show me what else he can't pop He's the God of the breakthrough Anything is possible There is a kingdom that's advancing at the speed of light, and in his kingdom, every dead thing is bound to rise. Oh God, our Redeemer, he is faithful to invite. Oh, he will.
Jacob better calm down up here. Don't make it too hard for me to preach. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 says this, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Watch this one. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Our Heavenly Father, I pray, God, that you will inspire us today to not give up. Lord, I pray that you will speak to our hearts now. Lord, as we have prepared ourselves, we've prepared our hearts through a time of worship and praise to receive the word that you have given to us. I pray that we would receive it with gladness. God, you give it to us as a gift, but a gift requires us to accept it. And God, I pray today that we will not be hearers of the word only, but that we will be doers and that it will impact us and change us and change our lives. God, I pray that each person will hear what they need to hear for themselves, not for their neighbors, not for their friends, not for their acquaintances, but God, you would speak to them today. Lord, I know we are so quick when we hear a word from you to say, oh, that's so good for someone else. But God, help us this morning to get rid of that pride inside of ourselves and say, that is so good for me this morning. And God, we thank you for all of this. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. I want to speak to you today on the topic of not giving up. Not giving up. Do I have any uh, 70s or 80s female babies in the house this morning? Come on, be heard. If so, you'll likely appreciate the title of my sermon today. It's titled, Hanging Tough. Oh. Yeah, yeah, nothing. All right. Now that we've all gotten that out of our system, y'all ready? Listen up, everybody, if you want to take a chance. No, not that one either. First line of that song. Y'all are too young for this stuff. Or you're like me. You have no idea, and you had to look it all up. So in our passage today, uh, Paul is speaking to the church of Galatia, and he tells them a pretty obvious statement. He says to them, a man reaps what he sows. In other words, you will harvest what you plant. Anyone have a garden this year? Yep. Yeah, I heard a yep. Um, Rick said a yep. Uh, Rick, what was the favorite thing that you planted this year? <laughs> uh, <my> tomatoes. <laughs> tomatoes. That was the same, same as first service. Uh, when you planted those tomatoes, um, did uh, not him, it was someone else for first service. They said tomatoes as well. When you planted those tomatoes, did apples come up on your tomato plants? No, what came up on your tomato plants? Hopefully, <laughs> tomatoes, tomatoes. Why do I say that? Because what we plant is what we will get. What we plant, what we sow is what we will harvest. So it doesn't take a horticulturist to, to understand that what you put into the ground, a seed that you put into the ground will spring up and produce the particular plant that you put into the ground. So why are we surprised that bitterness is springing up in our life when we planted unforgiveness? What did you expect was going to come up? You planted the seed of unforgiveness and you expect forgiveness to be sprouting up from that? It's not going to happen. What you sow is what you will reap. Why are we disappointed when we harvest anger? You planted resentment. And anger is what came out. And then we get disappointed that what we planted produced exactly what we planted. So if we want to produce some things in our life, if we want to see a harvest of different things, it's going to require that we sow in some different things than what we have been sowing before. You are simply reaping what you have sown. And let's be honest, some of your children are reaping what you've sown. And some of you are reaping what your parents have sown. And if we're going to break these generational curses, if we're going to break these stigmatisms in our life, we must start planting the right things in our environment in order to get the right things out. 
I got to thinking about this this week because Paul says, let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time. Some versions say at the right time. Other versions say in due season, in the correct season, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up or in other words, if you hang tough. Paul knew the temptation would be two things. Number one, it would be to grow weary with doing good. That would be the original temptation is for us to grow weary with doing good. And number two would be to give up. That's why he says, do not become weary in doing good and do not give up. As I thought about that this week, I thought, well, when do we typically get weary and give up? Well, when we aren't seeing the results we desire as quickly as we desire them. Right? It's when we're not seeing the things immediately that we become disappointed and we no longer want to do the good work. We no longer want to work hard. Let me ask you a question this morning. If you went to work for your boss tomorrow and your boss said, listen, uh, if you will work really, really hard this week, I will pay you in six months for your hard labor. <laughs> what would you say back? No, bye. bye. <laughs> right? Everyone's hiring right now. I can find a job. No, what am I saying is, is that typically we want an immediate payout for what we do. When we work hard, I want to get it right now because we are in a culture where we don't want to wait. We simply want what we think is owed to us. We don't want to wait for anything. But Paul said, if you do not grow weary, don't grow weary, don't give up. Keep doing what is good. And you will reap a harvest in the end. See, it's easy to do good when the payoff is immediate. But it's hard to continue the effort when the payoff is delayed. I was reading in Luke chapter 8 this week. And I want to draw your attention to a passage of scripture that speaks on this topic of hanging tough. I'll be honest with you. I thought I had a different sermon all week until yesterday morning. When God changed my heart and changed me to this particular passage and I want us to look here. In Luke chapter 8, we'll find the account of the woman with the issue of blood. You remember her? I talked about her back on July 25th in a, in a sermon uh, titled, but, but What If I Do? In that particular sermon, I talked about the woman who had suffered with this issue for several years that we'll read about her account again today. And, and that probably... Uh, the, the voices inside of her head were telling her, listen, you've spent all your money. You've tried doctor after doctor. You've tried everything in your power to get better, and it's never happened. It's not going to happen this time when you have an encounter with Jesus. Nothing's going to change in your life. And she had to say back to those voices, but what if it does? What if I do get better? What if this time is different? What if it's not like all the other times? What if this time I actually get to experience the real change in my life? It's, this story is actually sandwiched right in the middle of another story in Luke chapter 8. It actually starts with a different story entirely, a different account, and then this woman gets thrust into the middle of this, and then we finish it again on the other side of this with the rest of this story. So let's read it together, starting in verse 40. It says, Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus a synagogue leader came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house. Because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, he is now headed to the house of Jairus. Jairus' daughter is dying and she's on her deathbed, and Jairus goes to Jesus in faith, asking him to do something about it, and then Jesus turns, and he's on his way, and it says the crowds almost crushed him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. How many know this morning that when you touch Jesus, he take, takes notice? Amen. It's not a casual encounter with Jesus. Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him 
and how she had been instantly healed. And he said to her daughter, remember she has no name. No one knows what her name is, but Jesus calls her daughter. It doesn't matter that she didn't have an identity. It didn't matter that she wasn't popular enough in everyone's opinion. Jesus called her daughter. Your peace has healed you, or your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Now, we started off this particular passage in verse 40 with Jairus falling at the feet of Jesus, pleading him to come to his house because his daughter was sick. Then it says in verse 42 that as Jesus was on his way to the sick daughter, who we don't know the name, a woman interrupted the trip that Jesus was making to the home of Jairus. Oh, I hope I can help you see what happened here. Because I don't know how many times I've read this story, but it's never jumped out to me like it did as I read it this week in preparation for this sermon. Jairus' pain and desperation brought healing to this woman. Let me help you understand it. It said that Jesus was with a multitude who was pressing around him. And then it said Jairus came to him and said to him, My daughter is dying and asked him to come. And then it said as Jesus was on his way to go to Jairus' house. What does that mean? That means Jesus changed his course. Whatever direction he was heading in, he changed to go in the direction of Jairus' house. And as he's on his way to Jairus' house, the woman with the issue of blood has an encounter with Jesus. Why? Because the pain and suffering that Jairus had was only leading someone else to the precious saving grace of Jesus Christ. What he was going through that day was the catalyst that caused Jesus to go and have an encounter with the woman who needed healed. What am I saying to you? I don't know why you're going through what you're going through right now, but you need to understand what you're dealing with is leading others to their freedom. <laughs> what you're dealing with right now has caused Jesus to change his course and chart a new path to go somewhere else that someone else is going to have an encounter with Jesus. What if Jesus had continued in his route? I'm not saying that Jesus didn't know and that he wasn't going to do it anyway. But what I am telling you is, is that Jesus used the faith of one person, Jairus, so that the faith of the other person, daughter, could find her healing. He used the faith of Jairus to say, I am broken. I am desperate. I'm in need of some help here. I need you to come to my house. And when Jesus turned his attention to Jairus, this woman comes out of nowhere and touches Jesus. Now listen, Jesus could have kept walking, but he didn't. He stopped and said, who touched me? And the, everybody around was like, Jesus, everybody's touching you. What do you mean everyone's pushing up me? No, I felt power go out from me. Who touched me? What did this cause? This caused a delay. Because Jairus' daughter is in trouble. She's dying and now there's a delay. There's a situation we have to deal with here now. We have Jairus who has a devastating diagnosis from his daughter. She's about to die. And now this woman comes up. And let's be honest, she's been dealing with this for 12 years. What's another two or three hours? What's the big deal? She's been dealing with this for 12 years. Why, why, why can't she just wait a few more hours? Because Jairus' daughter is about to die. Why? I don't know if you realize this or not. My God is a God of delays. You don't want to hear that. But he doesn't always answer at the time you want him to. Listen, I've shared this a few times and I'm pretty sure someone in here must need to hear this again today. God has no timetable to answer your prayer. He will do it in his time because his time is what's best for you. Now you don't get it when you want it because if God gave it to you when you wanted it, you would take credit for it. You would say it's something I did in order to receive the favor of God in my life. But that's not what happened here and that's not what happens in your life. You ask, Jesus delays. He doesn't always meet your need immediately. Sometimes there's a process. There's a time that takes place in between when Jesus meets with us and the time that we ask for his help. Let me take you back for just a moment, though. How old was Jairus' daughter? Twelve. Says she was about 12 years old. It tells us that in verse 42. 12 years. It seems like I've heard that somewhere before. Oh, that's right. 
The woman who was dealing with the issue of blood has been bleeding for 12 years. <laughs> 12 years. Since God is not a God of coincidence, could it be that the same time the woman began her suffering with this condition of the, the, the bleeding, that God brought a little baby into the world that would usher healing to this woman? Could it be that at the same time she began bleeding uncontrollably and she could not find anything that Jesus was like, I'm going to send a little girl and everyone's going to think that she's going to die and it's going to take this little girl and me going to see this little girl to heal her of her condition in order to meet this woman. I will use this situation to speak to this situation. What am I telling you? I'm telling you that sometimes God uses you to reach other people. But listen, as long as, we, as long as we continue to allow the voices inside of our head to tell us we're not good enough, as long as we allow those voices to speak to us and tell us we're not worthy, I talked about this last week, how do you see yourself? How do you see Jesus and how do you think Jesus sees you? Because as long as you keep listening to those voices, you will never be able to do what God has called you to do. And what he's calling you to do is not just for you. He's calling you to do what you cannot do for yourself, but also what other people can't do for themselves. He's calling you to so much greater. Listen, God is not a God of coincidence. I want you to tell your neighbor, it's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence that you're here today. It didn't happen just by chance. You didn't just decide to wake up this morning. God had to give you the breath in your lungs. And you're here. You're here by appointment. You're here because God wanted you to be here. That's the reason why you're here this morning. You're here because God wants to deposit something in your life today. And it's up to you to choose whether or not the bank's going to be open. Am I going to allow the deposit into my life? Or am I going to hold up the sign that says close, try again tomorrow? God has something to deposit in your life. He is not a God of coincidence. And he used 12 years to speak to this woman. He is a God of delay. Could Jesus have healed the woman as soon as she started with her issue of blood? Most certainly he could have. Could he just have spoken the word and Jairus' daughter have been healed? Sure he could have. The centurion came to him and said, my servant is sick. He's about to die. And Jesus said, let's go have a look. And he said, you don't even need to go, Jesus. Just speak the word and he'll be healed. And Jesus said, your faith has made him whole. Amen. Jesus could have just spoken the word. But he begins to go towards Jairus' house. Why? Because he had an appointment with the issue of blood. And he used the appointment he had in one season to help in another one. But right in the middle of this, we have a delay going on. Jairus is waiting for his daughter to be healed. I don't know about you. I've got several daughters myself, some by blood, some that I've adopted. But I'm telling you right now, if one of them was on the deathbed and the, the solution was right there in front of me and the solution decides to take a pit stop on the way, I'm going to be a little ticked off. Like... Let's go. I know he didn't have a watch, but he was probably watching the sun. Like, it's been 15 minutes and 30 minutes. And Jesus, listen, she's about to die. I need you to come. And Jesus like, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. I got work to do right here. I've got to speak to my daughter for a moment. You want your daughter healed. I have another daughter to heal. Ooh, the Spirit just gave me that one. You've got one daughter that needs healed. I've got another daughter that needs healed. The one that nobody recognizes. The one that nobody even knows her name. It's not even important enough to put it in the Bible, but it was important enough for Jesus to say, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. There's this delay, though. What is Jairus to do? He's waiting patiently, maybe even not so patiently. Maybe he keeps yelling, but they just didn't put that in there. Jesus, we've got to go. I'm in a hurry. We've got to get this taken care of. My daughter is about to die. And Jesus just kept talking. He just kept talking to his daughter. We get the idea that Jesus somehow cared more about this woman than he cared about Jairus's daughter. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt like someone else is getting Jesus's attention other than you? <laughs> no, we don't have the honest crowd today. That's okay. I can preach around that. <laughs> like their need took a priority over yours. 
I've been praying for a better marriage and I'm watching everyone else get a better marriage, but I'm not getting one. <laughs> I've been praying for a husband and I'm watching everyone else get a husband and I'm not getting one. I've been praying for more money and I'm watching everybody else get more money and I'm not getting more money. We keep, we keep praying and asking God for things and sometimes it feels like we're watching everyone else get taken care of except for us. Again, it's not that this, issue, this woman's issue wasn't a big deal, but she's been like this for 12 years. A little bit longer wouldn't have been that big a deal, right? Well, to Jesus it was. He had an appointment with her, a 12-year appointment in the make. Actually, before she was ever formed in her mother's womb, God had an appointment with this woman on this day to heal her of her affliction. <laughs> Jairus' daughter is dying. Now watch what happens during the delay. Sometime while Jesus stopped for the pit stop, it says while Jesus was still speaking, while he was still talking to the woman, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and said, your daughter is dead. Your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. That tells me he had been bothering the teacher before. When they said, don't bother the teacher anymore. Now trying to imagine for just a minute the emotions that Jairus is feeling. He has had the attention of the one who could heal his daughter. He was so close to getting the healing for her, but now she's gone. She's dead. It's hopeless. Someone comes to him with his bad news and says, don't even bother the teacher anymore. In other words, Jairus, it's over. How many realize this morning it's not over until Jesus says it's over? Someone came to him though and said, it's over. See, when you're seeking the Lord for an answer, when you're pursuing Jesus for something in your life, be careful not to listen to those who keep telling you it's over. Amen. Be careful not to listen to the people who say, don't bother God anymore with your issue. It's over. It's dead. It's finished. I don't know who needs to hear this today, but you've been listening to outside voices telling you to give up. Don't give up. Amen. Don't give up. He's the God of the delay. And just because he's delayed doesn't mean he said no. Just because he's delayed doesn't mean he's not still going to move. It just may not be in your timing. It's not over. You're in a delay. I know it seems hopeless. I know it seems pointless to keep pushing and pursuing, but don't give up. You will reap a harvest if you do not give up. Someone needs to hear this morning, do not give up. I don't know who's on the fence today who is taking their last little bit of hope and throwing it to the wind and saying, I'm just going to toss it all in. I'm finished. I'm done. It's not worth it. But you need to understand this morning, the God of all creation has you sitting in the seat you're sitting in right now, listening to his words, telling you through his scripture, do not give up. It doesn't matter what everyone else says. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter that they say it's hopeless. It doesn't matter that they say don't bother him anymore. Your daughter's dead. Your dream is dead. Everything's gone. Just go back. Whatever. Just don't listen to those voices because the only one that matters says do not give up. Keep pushing. Keep doing what is good because at the right time, in the due season, in the correct timing of your life, God will allow you to reap a harvest if you do not give up. Now watch this. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. Out of everything Jesus could have said, he says, don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. That's it. Jesus 
you could have healed his only daughter with just a spoken word. You could have even said in that moment, listen, I've got this. I'm going to go to your house. We're going to see your daughter and she's going to be just fine. No, he said, don't be afraid. Just believe and she will be healed. Don't be afraid and just believe. See, be careful not to miss what Jesus is doing in your life right now because you don't agree with his process. Don't miss what Jesus wants to do in your life right now because you don't agree with how he's doing it. What happens to us too many times in our life is when we don't like the process Jesus uses, we decide to go back and try to use the process that we've used in the past that got us into this situation in the first place because somehow we feel like this will be greater for us than what Jesus could ever give us, the maker of all creation, the one who loved you so much he gave his life for you. We somehow feel like his way's not good enough. I'd rather have my process instead. But you need to understand that sometimes God uses the process of delay in your life. A delayed promise is not a broken promise. It's simply a delayed promise in your life. You need to understand this morning that he's teaching Jairus something in this delay. He says, do not be afraid. Why would Jesus say this? As I read this, I was thinking, fear is probably not the emotion I'm going to have right now. <laughs> My daughter's just died. You decided to take a pit stop for somebody who you could have healed on your way back. I'm angry. I'm agitated. I'm annoyed. My heart is broken. I hurt. Everything inside of me is screaming out. But now you're going to tell me, do not be afraid? I don't know that fear is my top thing here. I'm not sure that fear is what I really need to be dealing with here. But I need you to understand this morning that Jesus knows what your real issue is, even when you don't. He thought maybe all these other things were his issues. But what his real issue was, was his fear. Now I would love to be able to drill down and tell you exactly why fear was his big deal. I don't know because I don't know this man. I don't know what's going on in his life, but I do know this, that Jesus spoke to him and told him, do not be afraid. Listen, our fear manifests itself in several other ways. Other than just fear. Sometimes my fear manifests itself in anger. Sometimes it does it in bitterness. Sometimes it does it in rejection. Sometimes it does it uh, without allowing people to get close to me. I push them off because of fear inside of me. It may manifest itself a different way, but what Jesus was addressing was the core issue of Jairus, his fear. I don't know if you realize this or not, but Jesus isn't interested in fixing your symptoms. He's interested in making you well. If he simply chases your symptoms around, it will never get to the root problem. But Jesus knows so much about you. He knows why all your symptoms are happening. It's because of the core issue inside of you that he needs to address. And with Jairus, it was his fear. He tells him, do not be afraid. Why did he tell him that? He told him that because what he tells him next cannot be said until he tells him, do not be afraid. He says, do not be afraid and just believe. See, you can't believe and have faith and fear at the same time. They do not coexist with one another. In other words, if I'm full of fear, it pushes out faith. But if I'm full of faith, it will push out fear. I'm talking to some people in this room that have been so full of faith before in your life that even when nothing made sense, even when people told you this is completely stupid, what you're doing, that you had a peace of God in your life that passed all understanding. Who am I talking to this morning? The ones that have said, you know what? I am so full of faith today that this decision seems so stupid, but I'm doing it anyway because God told me to do it and I'm full of faith in this. Now listen, let me talk to the other people in here. Maybe it's the same people. Sometimes my fear has pushed my faith aside. Sometimes I become so full of fear that I don't allow my faith to act as it should and follow God as I should. And what he's addressing with him today, and he was addressing with him all those years ago, and you, you as well, is that when you are full of fear, you will not have faith. But if you're full of faith, it will push out your fears. 
There was a purpose in Jesus' delay. How many realize this morning Jesus always has a purpose in what he does? He doesn't wake up one day and be like, you know what, I think I might try this today and see what happens. <laughs> he has purpose in everything he does, and his purpose was to teach Jairus to have faith beyond what he could see. And I don't know who needs to hear that this morning, but Jesus wants you to have faith beyond what you can see. <laughs> beyond what you can hold in your hands. Beyond what you can see happening tomorrow or the next day or the day after that, Jesus wants you to have a faith that you, can, that you can't just see, but you know it's him and you follow his leading because faith comes by hearing, not by seeing. And hearing by the word of God. You will get your faith by hearing the word of God, by meditating on it day and night, by reading your Bible, by listening to sermons, by coming to church. You will receive all of these things in your life by doing this. So Jairus had enough faith to come to Jesus. Sometimes we have enough faith to come to Jesus. But would he have enough faith to believe Jesus when the situation went from bad to worse. <laughs> when he went to Jesus, it got worse. His daughter didn't get better. She got worse. How is it even possible? I took it to Jesus. I cast all my cares on him because he cares for me. How can it be that when I went to Jesus, my situation actually got worse? Because that's how God uses situations. Everything will not always immediately get better. Sometimes it will actually get worse. Why? Because you haven't learned the lesson you need to learn in the situation God has placed you in. You're still too full of yourself. You still have too much pride. And sometimes the situation has to get worse to push out your pride. It went from bad to worse. It begs the question for you this morning. Will you trust Jesus even when things go from bad to worse? Yeah. Will you trust Jesus even when he doesn't answer it as you see fit? Will you trust Jesus that his ways are higher than your ways and that his thoughts are higher than your thoughts? Will you trust Jesus that even though I've been praying for year after year, day after day, week after week, month after month, sometimes minute after minute, I've been praying and asking God for this and it doesn't look like it's getting any better. It's actually getting worse. Hey, listen, have you all ever been around somebody who God's working on? They get worse. It's the weirdest thing. I pray and ask God to move in somebody's life because of something that's going on in their life. I ask God to get a hold of them, use whatever it takes, and then I stand back and I'm like, what is going on? They actually got worse. Why? Because God is flushing out all of the bad in them. He has to get to the core issue. With Jairus, it was his fear. And with other people, it's going to be fear. It's going to be doubt. It's going to be worry. It's going to be self-worth. Whatever it is he has to get to, that's what Jesus is interesting in addressing. And he used a delay to address Jairus' greatest issue. Now somehow, some way, Jairus believes enough to have Jesus come to his house. And it says in verse 51, when he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. When Jesus arrived at the house of Jairus, he only took in Peter, John, James, Jairus, and his wife. Verse 52 says, meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. Stop wailing. You notice here that Jesus takes three disciples along with Jairus and his wife. We'll come back to that in just a second. But let me address the second part of that. There were people wailing and mourning for Jairus' daughter. I don't know if you know this or not, but in Jewish tradition, there were professional criers. This was their job. I, I don't know what level of sadness you have to get to 
to where you want your job to go and cry for people who died. But they would maybe have not even had any connection with this girl at all. But they had been paid to come and cry along with the family. Now listen, if she's not dead but asleep, they just lost their deposit. <laughs> there's no money to pay because there's no reason to wail. And Jesus tells them she is not dead, but she is asleep. And verse 53 tells us that they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. I need you to understand, again, going back to three disciples, Jairus and his wife. What is that important to understand? Those that doubted Jesus weren't allowed in. <laughs> Those that questioned his authority to raise her back to life weren't allowed in. Those voices that said she's dead weren't allowed in. Those that don't believe in what God is doing in your life right now are not allowed in. The problem is we keep an open door policy on our heart. And we allow anyone and everyone access to our heart. But when God is doing something in your life that the world does not understand, they do not have the right to come into your life. In fact, it would, be, it would do some of us good if we would put some no trespassing signs on our hearts. And say, if your ways are not God's ways, I don't want anything to do with your opinion in my life right now. Because I'm going to follow after what Jesus has for me in my life. I'm not going to worry about what you think would be best for me because your life is a mess as well. <laughs> Can we just talk about that for a minute? But instead, I'm going I'm to surround myself just like Jesus did with those who knew he had the power. I'm going to surround myself with some people in my life. Now listen, I'm not saying you have to cut off all acquaintances. I'm talking about your close contacts. I'm talking to people that have an audience with you. I'm talking about people who when they speak, you listen. Because not everyone who speaks and you listen should be speaking into your life. There are some people that you need to be claiming up against the scripture of God and saying, is what they're saying valid or not? Also, also, there are probably some people in your life that are speaking into your life about the goodness of God and telling you stuff you shouldn't be doing that you don't want to listen to. I'm not talking about you casting them out. I'm talking about you getting rid of the negative influences in your life. The ones that keep causing you to doubt God. I'm not talking about the ones that are pushing you to Him. I'm talking about the ones that are attempting to drag you away from Him. See, when you're chasing God, you need to surround yourself with other people who are chasing God too. Not a whole bunch of other influences. I need some God chasers in my life. I need some people that won't judge me when I'm going through a difficult time, but will say, you know what? I'm going to walk beside you during this time. We're going we're gonna to seek God's face during this. We're going to cry out to God. I'm going to pray for you, and we're going to work through this together. Those are the kind of people you need in your life. We need some people that are chasing God. Where are my unmarried people in the house? You all know what's coming. Don't settle for someone who doesn't chase after God. Listen, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. You can find someone anywhere. You can find them anywhere. You can pick up someone anywhere, but that doesn't mean that they're God chasers. The Bible tells us not to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever for a reason. The reason why he tells us that is because if I decide to get in a relationship with someone who is not a believer, thinking that in my fixer mentality, all I have to do is get them saved and then everything will be great. Listen, ladies, you need to understand this. If you haven't already learned this, men will do anything, anything to get what they want. They'll even say, hallelujah, praise Jesus on Sunday. They'll do whatever you want them to do to get what they want. And when they get what they want, they be gone. Right? What I'm saying is you need to find someone who chases God more than you do. Let them start the relationship. Let them start the conversation. Let them say, can I tell you about how good God has been to me today? Let them start that. Stop chasing people that aren't chasing God. 
God will send them your way. Keep praying, keep waiting, and keep your eyes open for the right thing and stop settling for the wrong. Woo! That's my soapbox. I'll hop off of it now. <laughs> Verse 54. Jesus took her by the hand and said, <laughs> My child, get up. Just a few moments ago, he said, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Now, this little girl had no faith. She was asleep. The world said she was dead. But Jesus took her by the hand. He did not have some long, drawn-out conversation. He didn't tell her she had to have everything right in order for him to wake her back up. He didn't tell her she had to live a perfect life or else it's not going to be worth bringing you back to this world. He simply said to her, my child, get up. It was a command. Get up. And guess what happened? Imagine, imagine this. When Jesus said, get up, she got up. It says her spirit returned and at once she stood up. And then one of my favorite passages, Luke 8.55, then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. <laughs> Listen, when we, when we awaken from a spiritual slumber, it's time to get something to eat. Can I get an amen about after a Sunday afternoon nap? It's time to get something to eat. Why did Jesus say this? Because he wanted them to realize this was tangible, this was real. This was not a figment of your imagination. A spirit can't eat food. Jesus said, I need to prove to you she really has been raised back to life. Give her something to eat. And they gave her something to eat. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Now watch verse 56. Her parents were astonished. Wait a minute. I thought Jairus had faith. I thought he had faith. But her parents were astonished. How could Jairus have faith and be astonished at the same time? You ever had that? You ever had faith enough to believe God for a little bit of what he did for you? And then you were astonished by how much he actually did for you? You're like, well, I think Jesus loves me this much, so maybe he'll give me this much. So I have this much faith, and then God is like, boom, let me give you everything. But then it says he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. The God of the delay still made a way. You realize how easy it would have been for Jairus to just give up? You realize how easy it would have been for him to lose heart? To abandon the cause, just go home. When they came to him and said to him, your daughter is dead, don't bother the teacher anymore. He could have just turned around and gone home and his daughter would have remained dead. But what happened? It says, while they were speaking, Jesus overheard them and he said, do not be afraid, believe, and your daughter will live. What does that tell us? That tells us that he had an ear for the Lord's voice. He had been waiting for Jesus to say, let's go, I'm ready now. He knew his voice. So when Jesus spoke to him, he knew his voice. So when he says to him, after all of this, and he says this to him, he knows his voice. He has enough faith to believe, but now it's actually happening. He didn't allow his fear to hold him there. He didn't allow his, his fear to keep him stuck. Jairus was in a desperate situation that went from bad to worse. Do you trust Jesus during the delay? And will you hang tough? Those are the questions I want you to ask yourself this morning. I don't know who, who this is for. It may have been first service. And maybe the whole second service this wasn't for anyone in here. I don't know. Sometimes I wish Jesus would tell me, the Holy Spirit would reveal to me every issue all they're going through, and then I realize, no, I wouldn't. I don't want to know what you're going through, because then you'll accuse me of preaching to you. <laughs> Instead, what I allow to happen is the Spirit to speak to you, and I, I trust He's done that today. Do we trust God during the delay? Because you might have been praying for something for a really long time, and it's just not happening. And now some outside influences are trying to tell you it's just time to give up. 
It's time to stop. You don't need to worry about this anymore. Just give up. But Jesus is telling you to hang in there. Hang tough. Do not give up. Going back to Galatians 6, 8. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Jairus sowed faith. And Jairus reaped a miracle. What are you sowing today? Do you trust God during the delay? Will you hang tough? And what are you sowing? Because if you're not sowing what is good for you, if you're not sowing what is right for you, if you are not sowing into the Spirit of God, then what you reap will only draw you away from Him. As the band comes this morning and gets ready, I want you to ponder on those thoughts this morning. And I want to pray for you. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you wouldn't mind, let's pray together this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. God, I'm thankful that we can read the same passage over and over again, maybe even for our entire life. But God, you open up new revelations for us and teach us new things based on the season we're in right now. And Holy Spirit, I don't know who this is for. You do. And I pray that you will minister to them right now in this moment. I pray that you'll speak to the hearts here who are just about to give up. Those who are hanging on by a thread. God, the old saying says, when you get to the end of your rope, just tie, just tie a knot in it and hang on. God, I believe there's some people in here who need to hang tough today. Some people who have listened to outside influences, people who are listening to the lies of the enemy, telling them it's not worth it, just give up. It's not worth it. God, I believe you have some amazing things to do in the life of people in this room. And if they will not grow weary in doing good, if they will not give up, that they will reap a harvest. God, help them to realize that they're in a, a delay right now. It's not a no. Maybe it is. But God, if they're asking for more of you in their life, if they're asking for you to work a miracle in their life, help them to realize that their timing is irrelevant to yours. You don't care how quickly they want it. You know what they need. And help us to realize this morning, God, that your timing is not our timing. Your thoughts are not our thoughts. Your ways are not our ways. Help us to realize today, God, that you are with us, that your promise is to never leave us or forsake us. And help us to cling to that promise today, even when we don't feel it you're working. Even when we don't see it, you're working. Why, God? Because you never stop working. God, we've seen you move in our lives before. We've seen you move mountains. We've seen you make a way where there was no way. And God, we're praying you'll do that again today. But teach us patience. Teach us surrender. Teach us to trust you, knowing that you have our best interests at heart. God, I pray that you'll speak to us in our hearts and our lives. I pray that you'll minister to us during this time of reflection. Help us to ask ourselves these questions again this morning. Asking ourselves this morning, Father, if we trust you during the delay. Asking ourselves, what seeds are we sowing into our lives? God, will we trust you when it goes from bad to worse? Or will we run and miss out on the opportunity you have placed in our life? God, help us to hang tough this morning. As we stand to our feet this morning, as we begin to sing.
want you to pray to God this morning to reveal to you in your life the areas where you need him most. I want you to be honest with him today, sharing your needs, your desires at the foot of the cross.
God, we thank you that you have never failed us yet. God, we're, many of us may be in a delay right now, in a season of our life. We didn't expect to find ourselves in. We didn't expect to see things be the way they are. But God, you have brought us to such a time as this to move in our lives. God, you have spoken to us. Lord God, I pray that you will continue to minister to us in our lives. I pray, God, that you will give us boldness to walk in the next season that you have already called us to. God, that you would give us the strength and the wisdom to see the opportunities that you're providing for us. Lord, help us to realize that sometimes what we're going through right now is the path that will lead others to you as well. God, you know best. And we are thankful that you know best. We're thankful that your promises still stand, that you are faithful. You have always been faithful. You always are faithful. God, I pray that you'll continue to minister to us. Help us, God, to hang tough this morning. Help us to trust you during the delay. Help us, Father, to see it all the way through to the end. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. We thank you for joining us today. We hope you have a fantastic week.